tonight on Unsolved Mysteries. Just before Christmas 1955, a newborn baby girl was abandoned in a New York City subway car. 40 years later, Jean Martin still dreams of finding her birth mother. Perhaps someone watching can make her dream come true. If you think sea monsters are nothing more than fanciful legend, you probably never visited Canada's Cadborough Bay. You probably never heard the incredible eyewitness accounts of a mysterious creature known as Cadborosaurus. In North Carolina, a night of drinking and joyriding suddenly turns vicious, and a young mother is thrown to her death. Also a rare glimpse into the mind of a criminal. Franklin Floyd is serving 52 years for kidnapping, but his victim, seven-year-old Michael Hughes, was never found. Incredibly, Floyd claims a kidnapped boy is alive and well, but refuses to say where he is. Stay with us. Perhaps you hold the key. Perhaps your call can help solve one of tonight's unsolved mysteries. For centuries, the stories have fascinated us. In Scotland, it's the Loch Ness Monster. In New York's Lake Champlain, it's Champ. There's Ogopogo at Lake Okanagan in British Columbia, Canada. And finally, in nearby Cadborough Bay is the legendary caddy. The thing I noticed most about it was its eyes, that they were big and they were serpent-like. The odor from it was just incredible. It permeated, it made you want to vomit. It went down and a hump came up, and then it went down and another hump came up, and it was like it was moving. They call it Cadborosaurus, Caddy for short, the sea monster of Cadborough Bay. Many people believe this is the carcass of just such a creature. Computer enhancement gives us an idea of what it might have looked like when alive. Like the biblical Jonah, it came from the belly of a whale. In 1937, uh, there was a whaling station in the north part of British Columbia. And uh, one of the whale boats harpooned this big sperm whale uh, about six hours run from the whaling station, towed it back, and the flensers got to it fairly quickly. Flensers are the workers who butcher the whales once they are brought to shore. Amazingly, a sperm whale has three enormous stomachs. Inside one of them, the flensers made an astonishing find. Instead of bringing out a big 10-foot shark or a giant squid or a, a rag, ragfish or something like that, they came across this incredible snake-like thing. None of them had ever seen it before. In years of whaling and flensing, they knew it was something different. The whalers took this photograph that very day. James Wakelin, then a 24-year-old blacksmith's assistant, is the only witness still alive who saw the creature with his own eyes. I don't know. I got no idea what it is. I haven't got a clue. Never seen anything like it. And I guess somebody thought, well, that's a queer looking affair there. We better get the manager or go and see about him about it. And he got it brought down and he took the pictures. Laid out, the creature measured some 12 feet long. It had a head shaped like a horse or a camel and a thin snake-like body, approximately 16 inches in circumference. Enormous detail is visible, especially in the tail region, which shows us that the it has a pair of hind flippers that were webbed together with the tail to form this whale-like fluke, which undoubtedly provided the main driving force for this animal. The whalers sent part of the specimen to the Provincial Museum in Victoria, British Columbia. 
There, the museum director, Francis Kermode, dismissed it as a fetus of a baleen whale and tossed it out. Even to untrained eyes, a baleen whale fetus bears little resemblance to the carcass examined by the museum director. If he just stopped and thought, would these men send down a fetal baleen whale? They dissected hundreds of these things out of dead whale uteruses every week. They, they knew what a fetal baleen whale. So that was really not complimentary to these professional whalers. If the whalers weren't wrong, maybe the creature was a fake. One of the most famous photos of the Loch Ness Monster eventually proved to be a hoax. Skeptics claim the Cadborosaurus photo is no different, but that hardly explains all the people in the 60 years since who insist they've seen a caddy-like sea monster. In 1968, William Hageland was sailing in a remote cove. As evening fell, he and his sons netted what he now believes was a baby Cadborosaurus. Looked like a little garter snake, but it was a little bit more husky than that. But it wasn't much longer, about 16 inches long, maybe the thickness of my thumb. But it had a little shoulders with little flippers on its shoulders, or, and uh, a bit of a neck, not much, but and a head on it with two bright brown eyes looking at us. Hagelin sketched the animal in detail. He decided to take the oddity to the nearest biology station but he was at least a day's sail away. Through the evening, I could hear this little thing making quite a fuss in the bucket that we'd put it into. But uh, when I shone the light down at him, he just opened his mouth and hissed at me. And you could see that he was quite terrified and quite put out with all of this. So I felt that maybe if we tried to hold him over a night that he might perish. So I just, uh, to a great deal of soul searching, decided to put it back in the water and leave it be. It was another opportunity lost. For the second time, what was thought to be a caddy was thrown back in the bay. In consultation with a paleontologist, we applied computer animation techniques to one of the original Cadborosaurus photographs. The skeletal structure is similar to that of a snake. A caddy seven meters long would probably have at least 360 vertebrae. That would give the creature enough flexibility to form the signature hoops so frequently mentioned by eyewitnesses. Unlike a snake, which can only wiggle from side to side, a Cadborosaurus could propel itself forward with its tail fluke and steer with its forefin, something like a sea lion. If this is truly an accurate depiction of a caddy, imagine seeing one in the wild. That's what a pilot spotted while flying a seaplane over Cadboro Bay. Two college boys saw it just 20 yards from shore. And a homemaker surprised the sea monster right on the beach. I was walking my dog, Lady. And as we were coming down the path to the beach, uh, she was struggling to get away from me. She just didn't want to go to the beach. Come on, Lady. Finally, I pulled her and pulled her, and she got closer. And as I turned to look down, I saw this face looking at me. And it was uh, shaped like a horse face. And there were eyes that were like a snake. And as I, I looked at it, it looked at me, and then it dropped its head below the cliff. It sort of took my breath away when I saw it. And uh, I just was thinking to myself, did I really see what I thought I saw? You know, what is it? I heard a sound, thought it was probably a whale or something, looked out, didn't see much, and heard it again and saw like a strange head out of the water about 50, 60 feet away. It had the definite snout with a big, uh, large head, um, really rocky looking, um, uh, a really greeny black color, almost like a garbage bag color was uh, a very odd looking uh, looking thing. It was a uh, hoop-like uh, creature. It had uh, two uh, vertical hoops uh, as we were on approach uh, and landing. We could uh, see that it was moving very quickly through the water and I would estimate to be about 40 miles per hour. And we could actually see through the uh, two hoops. We could see uh, you know, what was on the other side of the hoop. So that was very strange. 
It was the uh, most unique thing I've ever seen in the uh, in the waters around here. I've seen uh, you know, lots of different things, uh, but I've never seen something like that. It's our view that uh, the animal does exist because of the total mass of evidence. If these people who act independently over a century time and 3,000 miles of coastline were in collusion, it would be the biggest con game in the history of, of science. There's no way that happened. These people are totally unknown to each other. Skeptics abound, outnumbered perhaps only by believers. Doubters claim caddy eyewitnesses are mistaken. What they really saw were humpback whales, elephant seals, basking sharks, or perhaps a herd of sea lions. Hopefully the next person to get hold of a caddy will manage to resist the urge to dump it back in the bay. Perhaps then, this mystery will finally be solved. We'll be back in a moment with an urgent appeal from the authorities in North Carolina. They need your help to track down an accused killer. Most teenagers would do anything to avoid being with their parents. But to 17-year-old April Hart, nothing would be more precious than spending a few moments with her mother, savagely murdered when April was six. I just want to go back to being six so that she will be there beside me to play with me, and, and I'll have her there knowing she's there with me and not going like she is now. April's mother, Sherry, was last seen alive on a January night in 1984. The 24-year-old divorcee was supposed to meet a date outside a local restaurant. Sherry Hart did not come home that night or the next. Police located several friends who had seen her that evening. However, they found no evidence of foul play, no explanation for Sherry's sudden disappearance. For months afterwards, April heard rumors that her mother had run off to Florida with a lover. I just thought she hated me and didn't want to come back because she had me and she didn't feel like she was responsible for me. And I just didn't think she loved me anymore. Sheriff! What do you got, Doug? Female. She's, she's been here a while. Yeah, she's pretty well decomposed. The truth was worse, far worse. 11 months after Sherry vanished, an unrelated investigation led police down a 2,000-foot cliff. Locals call it the jumping off place. It was there that authorities found the body of Sherry Lyall Hart. Investigators immediately reopened the case. Sherry. Hi, guys. How you doing? Well, I was supposed to have a date about a half hour ago, but... They located a witness who had seen Sherry on the night she vanished with two high school friends, Jeffrey Burgess and Richard Baer. Where were you going? Nowhere in particular, just out, cruising around. Cruising around. No. How Police interrogated Baer and Burgess separately. Richard Baer's brother had once dated Sherry Hart. Okay. What time would that have been? Nine, nine o'clock. Are you sure about that? No, I'm not sure. It could have been 9.05, it could have been 8.55. I don't, I don't keep a watch on me and check in every minute, okay? We had witnesses that saw you together after 9 o'clock, and Burgess gave us a different time as well, so are you sure it was 9 o'clock? Look, right. look, let me tell you something. It was dark, it was cold. We dropped her off by her car. I don't know what time it was. But the stores were open? They were open. Okay. Richard Bear volunteered little information, so detectives pushed forward with other leads. We interviewed uh, a great deal of people, many people, and as a result of those interviews, we feel that we have developed a scenario as to what occurred that evening. <laughs> So where's this place we're going anyway? I figure we go cruising first. Uh, a couple of buddies of mine are down there. Meet up with them and then maybe go to the Twilight Club afterwards. Sounds good. At some point in time, this uh, 
riding around led them to an area, possibly in the vicinity of a nightclub or a, a party. And during this riding around, uh, Sherry Hart asked to make a, a rest stop. Authorities allege that Sherry and the two men pulled off the highway about one quarter of a mile from the jumping off place. You know what, Jeff? What's that? I think the woods are a dangerous place for a little girl. I think you might be right. <laughs> Oh, hey, sure, sure, sure. I thought I said, Richard, take your come time. On, let's get the car. No. Stop, Richard. Give me a let's... kiss. Me... No, Richard, stop it! Uh, Richard, yeah. stop! Yeah. Leave me alone! Stop it, no. Richard, stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Leave me alone! You're kidding me! Stop! Stop it! Stop it now! <laughs> help me! Whoa, 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 whoa. Help, please help me! <laughs> that night. Richard Bear was apparently carrying a handgun. What are you doing? Shut up and stay in the car, all right? <laughs> 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 Richard Bear and Jeffrey Burgess were charged with the murder of Sherry Hart. Turn to your right. Conviction could have led straight to the gas chamber. However, four months after his arrest, Richard Bear managed to escape from the county jail. Jeffrey Burgess was released on bail pending his friend's recapture. More than 10 years later, the trial has yet to begin. We uh, let those people down. We let the victim down. Uh, and we'd certainly like to have an opportunity to get him back to let them know that we want to see, we want to see justice done. This is probably as brutal a crime as you will ever uh, encounter because uh, of the horror, the fear, uh, the fright that that victim had to feel for several minutes before uh, she went over that cliff, because she would have, in my opinion, known enough to know where she was. She was an outgoing person. She liked people. She liked to have fun. She was a mother that loved her daughter very much. She thought more of April than anybody or anything. It won't never get behind me. I can't take looking at her grave knowing she's down there. And I want her to be here with me so I can just give her a hug and just have her in my life again. Recently, we profiled a pair of cunning criminals, two women who in some circles had achieved near folk hero status. The police knew them as a real life Thelma and Louise. If you passed them on the road, you would think they were just best friends out for a joyride. But over a three month period, nearly 1995, Rose Turford and Carolyn Stevens stole more than a quarter of a million dollars from at least 10 men. Their M.O. was simple, yet devious. Rose and Carolyn lured their victims to hotel rooms with a promise of an adventurous date. Rose and Carolyn 
from the onset wanted to be the real life Thelma and Louise. It, they wanted to experience that thrill and the spontaneity and the only thing is I don't believe they ever considered what they were going to do to their families. In March of 1995, Rose and Carolyn were finally arrested in Houston, Texas. Their families put up almost everything they owned to post a $500,000 bail. The Thelma and Louise bandits were released and promptly disappeared. As it turned out, our broadcast was a catalyst for a full-scale media blitz aimed at tracking down the two women. Here's Keely Shea Smith with the details. Bob, the story of the Thelma and Louise bandits appeared everywhere, in newspapers, magazines, and on television. But it was a t-shirt just like this one, which led to their capture in Toronto, Canada, less than five months after they had vanished. The gentleman that gave us the tip saw the pictures in the McLean's magazine of me holding the t-shirt up and called the number on the t-shirt. The tipster knew the whereabouts of Rose Turford. She was working at a telemarketing firm in Toronto. Within 24 hours, both of the fugitives were in custody. Probably the weirdest thing in this whole chase was watching those two smile going to jail, looking at all the time that they're looking at. They smile for the cameras. Turford and Stevens were extradited to Texas and are currently being held here at the Harris County Jail in Houston. I think that anyone who does a series of aggravated robberies are nothing more than criminals. They're not anything special. Uh, they're not anything to admire. Uh, they're not anything to emulate. They're just robbers. Next, a provocative case study of a criminal mind. Meet kidnapper Franklin Delano Floyd. And later, the poignant tale of a baby girl abandoned on a subway. As a grown woman, she dreams of a Christmas reunion with her birth mother. This is Michael Hughes. He is seven years old and has been missing for more than 14 months. In 1994, Michael was living with foster parents when he was abducted by a man who claims to be his father. You're acting like I walked up to a McDonald's and took a strange boy and walked off with him. And that's where you're wrong. This is Franklin Delano Floyd. In fact, he is not the father of Michael Hughes. Today, Floyd is serving a 52-year prison sentence for kidnapping Michael. Floyd insists the boy is alive and safe, but he refuses to tell anyone where Michael is or who is sheltering him. The case of Franklin Floyd and Michael Hughes is one of the most bizarre we've ever profiled. A twisted tale of deception and deceit that truly defies rational thinking. We now join Kevin Ogle from our NBC affiliate KFOR-TV in Oklahoma City. This is Indian Meridian Elementary School just outside of Oklahoma City. On September 12, 1994, Franklin Delano Floyd walked into the office of Principal James Davis. Floyd said he was the father of six-year-old Michael Hughes, and then Floyd said he had a gun. He came in, he was acting rather nervous. He said, what I'm doing is very difficult. He said, I think I should tell you I've got a gun in my pocket. At that time, he, he was sitting right here he reached in his pocket, and he pulled the gun part way out of his pocket, enough that I could see the handle in the palm of his hand, and then he put it back in his pocket. He said, I'm ready to die. If you don't help me, you won't live either. Principal Davis led Floyd down this hallway to Michael's classroom. Floyd then forced both of them into Davis's pickup truck and ordered Davis to drive out into the country. 
then when we got down here a ways, he told me to, to stop. And he had me to get out of the truck and go into the woods. He left Michael in, in the truck, and he followed me into the woods. He said, sit down by that tree and put your arm between those two trees. So I couldn't sit, so I just did like this and put my hands behind me. And he handcuffed my hands behind me like this. Five hours later, Principal Davis was rescued. For the next two months, there was no sign of either Franklin Floyd or Michael Hughes. Police swore out a warrant for kidnapping. Finally, Floyd was arrested in Louisville, Kentucky, but Michael was nowhere to be found. The authorities began to probe into Floyd's background. They discovered a past remarkable for its demented behavior. In 1975, Floyd, then 32, had turned up in Oklahoma City, going by the name Trenton B. Davis. With him was a young girl. Floyd claimed she was his daughter, Suzanne. Over the next decade, Suzanne and Floyd moved from town to town using a variety of aliases. In 1988, Suzanne, then 17, gave birth to his son, Michael. Incredibly, Floyd claimed to be the boy's father. Even more incredibly, he then turned around and married the woman he claimed was his daughter. Then in 1990, when Michael was two, Suzanne was killed in a mysterious hit-and-run accident. The prime suspect, though he was never charged, was none other than Franklin Floyd. Floyd vanished, but only after he had left Michael with foster care. Michael's foster parents remember him as a child with many difficulties. He was not up to grade for his age. He, he, wasn't, he didn't have muscle control like he should have. Uh, he did not talk at all. Uh, he was very hysterical. So he just wasn't, he was, I want to say malnutrition, but that ain't the right no, word. But he, he was delayed <laughs> so severely that he was in an infant STEM class and he tested out at nine months. When he was two? When he was two. Six months after abandoning Michael, Franklin Floyd was arrested on a parole violation. At that time, a routine blood test delivered a stunning revelation. Floyd was not Michael Hughes's biological father after all. I want to plead for the return of my son, who I love with all my heart. I've never harmed my son, and the case has been reversed by the Supreme Court. When Floyd got out of jail, he requested that custody of Michael be returned to him. His request was denied. Six months later, Floyd would abduct Michael Hughes from his first grade classroom. Michael has not been seen since. We would like to have some information from the public indicating that this child has either has been seen out there or is out there somewhere, or they may know something about him being assaulted or possibly murdered. That's what our interest is. Well, you know what people say. The reason you won't tell where he is. Yeah, because they think he's dead. That's right. Well, they just have no evidence of that. Michael is not dead. Why won't you tell us where he is? It's none of your damn business where he's at. You don't have a right to love him, care for him, and cherish him, because he ain't yours. From the start, the case of young Michael Hughes has been marked by disturbing, unexpected twists. And now there is one more. Only recently, the police learned that Michael's mother, Suzanne, was not Franklin Floyd's biological daughter. In fact, she may also have been kidnapped by Floyd. How did she come into your life as a little girl? I, I very bluntly say that I, I, uh, she was abandoned to me and I raised her. Uh, if I actually told you and you believed it or I could prove it to you, you know what you do? You try to pin a medal on me for taking her. Where'd you she come from? You, you really would. I can't tell you that. I wish that I could. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you right now, I did her a favor. That's one of the biggest mysteries that we have in this case as to who this girl is. We have absolutely no idea. We know that she is not the biological daughter of Mr. Floyd, and we feel that there's a very good possibility that this young girl may have been abducted or kidnapped uh, when she was probably three, four years of age, and we would like to find out her true identity. We don't know that.
In a moment, two armed robbers hit a small town post office and terrorized the postmaster. Epps, Alabama, of the population of just 300, is the very definition of off the beaten path. The local post office is much like the town itself, small, quiet, and friendly, a most unlikely target for robbery. Say hi to Helen for me. October 30th, 1987, began like any other day for Opal Johnson, the postmaster in Epps. Everyone that came into the office was people that I knew almost except hunting season. And then there were strangers who came into the post office quite often. So that's why I did not really notice this guy when he came to the window, because I thought he was someone there hunting. At around 11 AM, two strangers, one white and one black, came in for stamps. Uh, one stamp or the whole book? This is a robbery. Where it is, go ahead and take it. Go ahead. Get in the back, get in the back. Move it, move it, move it. After the black male, jumped over the counter, he immediately began to give orders. You the postmaster? Yes. Where's the safe at? He seemed to be real familiar with the operation of the postal service. The black male gave all the orders. He would, he told the white male everything to do, and he did it. Get over there, get over there. Move it, move it. Stay calm, nobody gets hurt. Check the purse, check the purse. What else is there? Nothing, you took it all. You best not be lying. Whatever it says. I never took money to work with me. I had a dollar and 38 cents. Is this all there is? That's all. I don't have much money on me. That's all there is. Kill her. No. Okay, be calm. Be calm. Kill her. And the white male says, man, let's don't do that. Says, says she did everything we told her to. He says, OK, we'll take her with us. The thieves made off with about $700 in cash and stamps. One of the men forced Opal into her car and followed the other out into the country. It would turn out to be just a 10-minute ride. For Opal, the most frightening 10 minutes of her life. When the white boy got into the car, he put his gun across his lap with his finger still on the trigger, and it was poking me in the side. And he was extremely nervous. What are you doing? You're going to shoot me. Just don't do anything stupid, and it'll be all right. Finally, the tiny convoy pulled into a remote clearing near Goggins Lake, three miles from town. Whatever you do, don't make him mad. I can't control him when he's mad, OK? Don't open the truck. Open the truck. Get out the car. Get out the car. He said, give me your rings. I like those rings. And as I was taking my rings off, I looked at him, and his eyes looked as if he hated the world. They were just piercing, and he was just angry. It's like he was angry with everyone in the world. I was sure that they were going to kill me. Oh, man, let's go. We need to dump the car. I and I just thought, well, they'll drive my car off into the lake. You see our faces. Who cares? we got to go. There's people coming. Let's go. Oh. They got in their car, and they left. And I could not hear it anymore. I began to feel around in the car, and I could see if I could go into the car through the back seat, and it's metal across there, no possible way. So then I found a tattoo, and I took that tattoo, and I began to work on that lock. And when I broke the lock enough, the trunk popped up, and I come out of that trunk running. Within an hour, Opal had provided police with a detailed description of the two men. The first suspect would now be in his late 20s. 
He was five feet, five inches tall and weighed approximately 130 pounds. He had brown hair and green eyes and was probably not from the South. The second suspect was about six feet tall and slender. He would now be in his late 30s. He had long, heavy sideburns, greasy hair, and dark eyes. Authorities believe he may have had family in the Epps area and that he may have previously worked in the mail service. When we return, 40 years ago, a baby girl was abandoned on the subway in New York City. Can you help turn a Christmas mystery into a Christmas miracle? ago, the approach of Christmas brought no joy to a lonely young woman in Brooklyn, New York. On the afternoon of December 11th, 1955, she boarded a subway train, rode four stops, and exited without a word. For reasons unknown, she left behind a tiny baby girl. By the next day, the infant was something of a celebrity, dubbed Miss Subways by the local press. Despite the publicity, no one ever claimed the baby, and a year later, she was adopted. Christmas means different things to different people. For Jean Martin of Long Island, New York, the holiday season is a time of reflection and hope. Jean, you see, is Miss Subways, and the mysterious woman on the train was her birth mother. Perhaps tonight, someone watching can help Jean's Christmas dream of a reunion come true. Jean grew up in a happy, loving home. From an early age, she knew she had been adopted. But through the years, Jean's questions about her past fell on deaf ears, almost as if her parents were protecting her. Michael, no, no! Oh, Michael, hey, get out of here! You go keep your eye on the grill. As her own children grew, Jean became more and more curious. Fine. We're almost ready. Finally, in July of 1992, Jean once again pressed her mother for answers. You know, Ma, this may not be the best time to bring this up again. Oh, no, Jean. But I really feel I need to, for the kids' sake, for medical reasons. You're going to hate me. No. You're going to hate me. No, Ma, I could never hate you. I love you. Jeannie, you were abandoned. Abandoned? on a subway. Oh. I was shocked at her reaction, which threw me. It was basically the driving home that day. It was a total identity crisis because nothing belonged to me. There was no name. There was a name on the adoption papers, which I thought to be my birth name, but that wasn't mine. I had no birth date. Uh, my religion wasn't mine. There was nothing, just nothing. Once she got over the initial shock, Jean began the search. At the local library, she spent hours in front of the microfilm viewer, sifting through newspapers from 1955, the year of her birth. I was letting the, the microfilm roll, and I saw the oh top of the policeman's hat, and it said, Miss Subways, and I saw this baby, and I was devastated. Oh, my God. Please, please. I just felt like all the blood had just drained out of my face and my fingers. I went numb. It's me. Oh. I was it's nauseous. Me. I felt That's faint. Exciting. It was you incredible. Want a copy of that, don't yes. You? Yeah. Oh, uh, yes, sure. I want a copy, please. The newspaper account gave Jean a tantalizing glimpse into her unknown past. A past which began when the lonely young woman entered the subway station at Coney Island. She walked slowly and carried an old battered suitcase. 
the woman took a seat off to herself in the lead car. Several passengers recalled that the woman opened her suitcase, shielding it from view, and took something out. She exited the train at the Van Sicklen Street Station. Seconds later, Watch this. It was Jean, no more than five days old and wrapped in a blanket with a full bottle of milk tucked inside. Somebody left this baby on the train. Hey, tell the motorman not to leave the station. So the baby was just left on the train. Can you imagine that? I can't believe it. Jeez, I hope she's all right. Oh, you walk there. One right here, one in the there. The passengers are able to provide police with a vague description of the young mother, but no one had any idea who she was or why she had abandoned her baby. Extra, extra, get your here. Get the next day, the saga of Miss Subways was splashed across the front pages. This photograph of baby Jean was seen by thousands, but Jean's mother never came forward. Now, some 40 years later, Jean Martin is convinced that her birth mother had her best interests at heart choosing to leave her in a place where she was certain to be quickly found and turned over to the authorities. My feelings are desperate people do desperate things. I need information. I need somebody who remembers something, somebody who remembers a neighbor, maybe even someone who was on the train who saw her or maybe even recognized her but at the time was afraid to come forward. I'm ready to meet her anytime, anywhere. From all of us at Unsolved Mysteries to all of you, our best wishes for a safe and joyous holiday season. May peace be with you, and may all your mysteries be solved.